How's it going, everybody? Seth Martin with Go Guide here. Uh, I have an awesome guest, Brian Slusser, on today with Four Seasons Fly Fishing. Uh, Brian was actually one of the very first outfitters ever to take a chance with Go Guide, and he's been using the system ever since. Um, super awesome to have you on. Thank you again for doing this, Brian. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. So, yeah, like I mentioned, um, you were one of the very first outfitters to join on with us a little over a year ago. I'm sure yeah. you remember that. Yes. Um, I just like to start by kind of talking about that. What What was it really that um, made you decide that you were willing to take a chance on us? And um, how's the experience been so far? Uh, the experience so far has been good, perfect. Um, how I decided, I think timing is everything. I was looking for something uh, like this and I'd, I'd seen a couple of other products out there, but I thought they were, um, they're just, there was too much. I'm just an individual guide service. I don't need all that other stuff. So, um, you guys called and, um, you were in your infancy stages and it seemed like the stuff that you had was just what I needed. I, I, I didn't have a need for a lot of the accounting software and other things people were trying to sell me. So. It was sim simple and timing was awesome. Well, that's great to hear. Yeah, we, we've definitely tried to pride ourselves on keeping it as simple as possible um, and really trying to tailor it to single guides like yourself, um, as well as large outfitters, um, kind of like a one size fits all system. But Brian, you've been in the industry for how long now? Uh, this is season 26. Wow. Um, I'd love to kind of hear how you got started, um, tw I guess, 26 years ago, um, when you first kind of got into fly fishing and then when you first started guiding and how that experience came to be. Um, fly fishing off and on since I was a little kid, my father introduced me to that. Um, we lived in Alaska for the, I guess, until I was about 13. So, um, we did a lot of hunting and fishing, as you can expect, and a lot of fishing in the summer and definitely hit, hit the hunting hard in the winter. My dad had a plane and we kind of flew everywhere and landed on beaches and middle of rivers and did all the stuff people pay a lot of money to do now. But that was back in the late 60s, early 70s. It wasn't a lot. Was of, that all typically up in Northern California where you are now, or did you guys take that plane other way? No, this was in Alaska. Exclusive. Okay. Um, my dad ran all the remote telephone offices in various places for a while. So we lived in Nome, started in Seward and finished in Valdez. So um, spent a lot of time there and fishing was a big part of it. And then we moved back to Washington, where I was born, and, um, Eastern Washington, specifically Chelan, Manassi area, and uh, continued fishing in and hunting and stuff, but not the plane went away and went to dirt bike access kind of stuff and just that sort of thing. And during college and kind of getting out of high school, going to college and stuff, I didn't fish at all. Didn't lift the rod very often. Did, did a little bit of hunting, but school was kind of the priority and um, getting through that. And I also, to put myself through school, I worked on for the Forest Service on a hotshot crew, so there's no time. And uh, that's kind of where I got to, I, want, I think I want to do something like that, that be in the outdoor industry in some fashion, fashion and going to all these cool places, but um, you know, I'm digging line and sucking smoke and not having a whole lot of fun. And I see people out there who are flying over in helicopters and stuff, getting water skiing and doing everything that I wanted to do in the summer and just wasn't doing it. So um, I tried to get a job with the Forest Service. That didn't work. Gave it a few seasons and that wasn't going anywhere. So I just completely switched gears and stayed in Tahoe. I, I ski patrol in the winter and I came to Tahoe to ski patrol thinking I'd stay for a little bit. And 30 years later, I'm still here and I still ski patrol full time in the winter. And uh, so I was, with the help of some of the um, fellow controllers, I got hooked up with some construction work, and I was doing that, and 
I did that as a kid too, and I'm, no, that's not for me. I don't want to do that either. And so I was just looking for something to do, and I saved my money. I was like, I'm going to try to start this business for myself. I went to school for business administration, marketing, and stuff like that. I got some skills doing that. I taught skiing, and done some other things. I said, I, I, can, I can do this. And uh, so I just started asking around. I went to a few shows, went on a guide trip here and there, and uh, didn't seem like it was too. In California, there isn't a whole lot of regulation on you have, you have to bond and pay your money. And they give you a guide's license. They don't even ask if you have <laughs> insurance. Um, but I kind of approached it was like, can I get a permit to work where I want to work, which is in the Truckee area? And if I could, then I would start. Otherwise, I would probably have gone back to Alaska for somebody else for the summers. So that's kind of how I got started. Right. I, got, I got a permit, and so I kind of went all in as much as I could and uh, did construction. We only worked four tens at the time. I guided on the weekends to get started, figuring it would take me a few years to build the customer base, which it did. And so that worked out good. And then uh, went on a rafting trip and uh, separated my shoulder and came back to work. And the boss said, I got no work for you until you get better. And it's like, okay, bye. And it just <laughs> happened to be before cell phones and things like that. So you're doing all your uh, contacts and stuff through answering machines, answering the telephone, that kind of stuff. So um, it just worked out. I was home with a bum shoulder and I could still tie flies on. I could still do all the stuff I needed to do. And I was answering the phone and getting the people before anybody else was. And I ended up doing quite well. And that kind of started me down that path. Well, that's, that's great. I'm sure uh, the, being a fly fishing guide is a little bit more enjoyable than that contracting work. Um, yes. So I imagine that you're happy with that decision in the end. Yeah. Um, uh, obviously. Yeah. Go ahead. I just, that I, I was going that way anyway, so yeah. just getting that, that extra boot. You mentioned that you um, have been ski patrol for 30 years now as well and that's kind of what originally brought you out to the tahoe area how is that juggling i guess obviously two very seasonal um jobs i imagine it works well obviously because they're opposite seasons but um they're both very active obviously and for to do it for 30 to 30 years for ski patrol and uh 23 years for fly fishing how's that been um kind of juggling those two jobs um, it works out pretty good. I mean, I'm not the first guy to do it. There's a lot of guys in other Western states that are doing the exact same thing. Um, so I actually been ski patrolling for 37 years full time. And, wow. Uh, yeah, the, it takes a toll for sure, especially here where I work at Alpine Meadows. Um, it's it's full on most of the winter, and uh, it works out good because. You, you have a steady winter income, which as a solo guide, you kind of need that, or you need to go maybe to South America or something like that. I thought about that too. Um, but I also worked a bunch of summers on the road. And I just want to be based somewhere for a change and have uh, a home base. So uh, Chucky worked out. That's kind of yeah. how I ended up. Well, it's a great area for those for those two uh, two activities. That's for sure. Probably one of the best. Um, honestly, I I remember we had talked about your season this year um, at Alpine. I mean, you guys were skiing on the Fourth of July. It's obviously is it typically like that, or was that a, a much later season than normal? Um, I wouldn't say that it's typical, but it's the third time that uh, I've done it since I've worked here and maybe the fourth time that we'd stayed open that late. Um, wasn't the best 4th of July, despite all the snow, we've had better skiing on the 4th of July. Yeah. Uh, 96, 95, that was an epic 4th of July. Um, yeah, so it was Yeah, from what, 
from what I noticed, it seemed like it was snowing hard while it was snowing, but then once it stopped, it got hot real quick. And I'm sure yeah. that's that's kind of what happened. It melted to most of that snow uh, fairly quickly. Um, not as quick as you think. We still have a lot of big patches on the ridges, which, let's say, the last five years have been gone by now. First of August, no, there's nothing on the north facing slopes, but there is still fairly good sized snow patches now. And that's working in our favor for the fishing because we're getting cold water and um, still getting some of it. Not, not a lot. You know, we're pretty much the tap is full open or the tap is full closed here. And it's trickling right now. Someone needs to fix the gasket or not. So we're having a little bit of extra water. It's cold water, which is unusual from the last um, decade or so where we haven't had very cold water. Um, and part of that is largely deep there, not dumping Lake Tahoe at the moment. And that water comes off the top and it's 70, 72 degrees during the day. So wow. it really affects our fishing on the trucking. But we have a couple of tailwaters and they're in good shape, lots of water. They're both running um, at a solid flow of what they, what they usually aren't at this time of year. So they're both over 100, which is awesome. And uh, usually it's 30 CFS. So. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because um, I had heard, obviously, in other regions, because we got so much snow this year, it actually kind of negatively impacted some of the rivers because there was so much runoff. Did you guys kind of see that at all in the Truckee, or is it pretty pretty well regulated with the Tahoe Dam? Um, we had some high flows, yes, um, stuff that wasn't it just wasn't that fishable. But hey, the reservoirs we have three of them here, um, and they were collecting runoff from all their creeks, and I, I, the fish figured it out pretty dang quick because they were running up every little thing they could. And uh, fishing this spring was. If you just listen to the people talk about just the Truckee River, it wasn't, yeah, you're not fishing that. I'm not taking a the kid there. I mean, right. see you later, bye. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, I, the little streams that are normally flow for a few weeks were flowing really good and still are in some cases. And cold and the fish responded. They were making their spring runs to spawn and we found found the resident rookies still hanging out there just like they always do. And, a few, uh, few more rainbows, and it seems like the state's been doing an excellent job of reintroducing the cuts up the last few years, and they were all running up there too to spawn. So um, I think it was a pretty, pretty exceptional spring. You just had to go to different places. You couldn't go fish that truck. Right. And that kind of leads me on to my next question. So obviously, uh, I would say, or I would assume, I guess the Truckee is kind of your main river of guiding. What are some of the other areas, rivers, still water that you do um, guided trips on around that, that area? Uh, the Little Truckee between Boca and Stampede, for sure. That's, that's very popular. Get a lot of requests for that. And then the three reservoirs locally. I don't really fish Boca that much, but Boca, Prosser for sure, and Stampede, when it's right, I will go out there and, and hit that because that is really, really good fishery. And then uh, Milton Reservoir. And then there's just a lot of little, there's seven or eight little creeks and stuff that you can access between town and, um, say, Sierraville. So lots of the feeder streams into those reservoirs are fishing good. So for those those listening who might not quite know, um, can you kind of walk us through the difference between this river fishing and, and still water at some of these reservoirs? Sure. Um, basically, uh, our stuff here is pretty small. Um, it's not conducive to walk and wait on the Truckee or the, the Little Truckee or even any of the, the feeder streams to those reservoirs. So we're doing a lot of walk and wait. you got to cover the water. You can expect to do... A couple miles with me in a half a day. Um, I have some clients that he has a bet with his dad that if I take more than seven miles, they get steak dinner. So those guys are doing seven plus miles in a day. So Gabe gets his dinner. And, uh, you know, a lot of it uh, can be very easy, but some of it is pocket water and it's bouldery, you know, the size of cars. So we're running around through that stuff and climbing over it and stuff. So it can be very active and it, it can be 
also I'd say moderately active. We're just going to cover a lot of ground on the, the easier walking stuff. Um, everything is short. You don't really need to cast over 20 feet here to have success. And the big thing is just keep it short and keep it in control. You don't try to, to overfish it. A lot of folks that are coming from saltwater background and stuff like that, they want to cast. They're just used to gunning it out there, double hauling. It's like, whoa, 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 back up. We can. We don't have to look that hard. We can lob it out there with a roll cast very short and maintain control of that drift, and you're going to be very well here. The Chucky, in particular, lends itself to Euro nymphing, check nymphing, any style of nymphing that you want to do. Um, it's, it's a perfect river for that, and as well as fishing dry. And sorry to interrupt, but for those, just those listening who may not know, what's what's the difference in Euro nymphing, check nymphing, um, and regular nymphing? Um, what you refer to as regular nymphing, I would probably just throw a, an indicator on. Um, with the Czech style and Euro style, you're um, getting the weight down there with the flies. You're not using an indicator. You're probably using a uh, cider material, which is just a color change uh, piece of leader material tied in there. Um, and then rigging your flies a little bit differently for each. Um, both of them benefit from slim flies with tungsten beads. Um, one's fishing more of a up, straight upstream direction, the other is a little more up and across. But anymore, I'd say that the stuff is blended. If you're you're fishing and you're doing either style, you're probably combining the two a little bit to some degree. And um, to me, they're, they're pretty similar. You can stand in one spot and do both techniques pretty easy. Right, and that would uh, primarily be for stream fishing or river fishing. Uh, I would imagine for still water, do you use some other techniques? Yeah, for still water, you, you can throw the bobber back on and do quite well fishing under the indicator. Um, and that is a, a viable technique is fish in the lake or on the move. So you can put your stuff out there, let it soak for a while, and the fish are, are basically coming to you. Um, a lot of the sh shore fishing is is easy um a good sinking line is nice an intermediate line is nice but the indicator fishing in the lakes is, is pretty much uh the go-to for me or a dry dropper or fish using a dry fly and then suspending a small nymph under that those would be the, the primary way to tap of the, the reservoirs and then in the fall in the the browns and stuff back now cruising around getting all antsy to spawn and the stream of fishing will those take them to do it pretty good. You can do quite well there as well. I would say for folks that aren't familiar with the Truckee, it's it's a fickle river. Um, it's not uh, super easy to find places to cast a traditional sinking line and stuff. Um, it's better to have a compact scattered or trout space set up for that. So I'm probably getting a little bit into the weeds for some folks, but um, one of the things I do, I do a lot of different styles and a lot of different fishing. And I think that that kind of is what separates me from some of the other guys is I'm not just looking at the bobbers all day. I, I try different stuff. Um, right. Sometimes you have to. You know? And there's times when, yeah, the indicator rig in high flows is probably where it's at. And that's what we're going to do. Just whatever's going to work for the given situation with flows and stuff. But you can, if you're a dry fly purist, this is your year because you're going to get to fish flies <laughs> all the way without much interruption. Where last year, it was just too warm. The last couple of weeks of August, we had to wait for the next storm for things to cool off and um, the fishing to kind of come around. Even on the tailwaters, it was hot. So this year's good time to be here dry fly purist uh, that's awesome <laughs> um i'm curious as somebody who's who's fished the truckie as as much as you uh what would your suggestion or almost ideal rig be for someone going out there on their own let's go through uh weight of rod a uh, line type and then maybe a couple fly suggestions just for someone getting out there um, and want, looking to catch some fish. 
uh, seasonally dependent, if I could qualify it. I'd say for most of the season, you can get away with a nine foot five weight. Um, but I would use a 10 footer in the spring and in high flows, just to make it a little bit easier to get a little more reach. Um, and yeah, if, if I have my choice, I would probably just fish dry dropper, extend the drop very long for the, the deeper sections, shorten up for the shallower stuff. Um, good flies for here, uh, to support that. The classic that probably every guy in the West uses is the chubby. The chubby Chernobyl pattern will work um, very well. A local pattern that I like a lot that a guy from Sacramento ties up for Umpqua is the double dutch. That's a very good pattern for our area. And if you guys haven't tried it, you should try it in your area too because it really is a good fly. Um, and then for your dropper, Lately, I don't think it matters, um, but a tungsten jig fly in green is a good. And style. jigged, do you say jigged because um, typically those sink faster, the way that they carry through the water? You just don't get snagged as much. That's what I like about it. That's it big. sinks fast, <laughs> tungsten, tungsten, and it doesn't snag. You run, try to run a traditional curved hook in a regular you know, straight eye or downturned eye with a, a bead on it and you get snagged a lot more. So it's just make it simple on yourself and use a jig fly and you'll go through less of them. Yes, I know they're a little bit more money, but you're not going to be burning through them like I was trying to fish like a bird, traditional bird's nest, which is one of my favorite patterns, or hare's ear. And um, put that on a jig and put a tungsten bead on it and it's it's even better. So for, for dropping flies, um, definitely uh, a hare's ear is a good all around pattern here. Uh, Any time of year, the classic stuff, princes, all that stuff works. Copper johns are excellent for a nymph. And then on top, like I said, the double dutch, the chubby, anything big that will support the, what you're trying to put out there. And awesome. Fish a dry fly. I would probably go with the Parachute Adams because you can color it to fit whatever you need to. I have Perry Sharpies and I change them. And uh, so you could have that in your arsenal and, and go that route as opposed to like exact match, match the hatch. And then the other. I've never, never heard that carrying Sharpies to. So you, what, you, you basically Sharpie the bottom of your fly in order to just change it um, and yeah, so give a different yeah. presentation? Just make it look a little different. So if March Browns are happening, I have a brown one. I color them brown. We have an orange salvus mayfly, which a lot of people call our PMD, and it's it's bright orange. So I have a bright orange sharpie, and I just color it, and it works. So you know, it's simple. I'm not trying. To yeah, that's a great idea. Reinvent the wheel, and I can <laughs> buy those flies. As I and have them, and the standard Percy Adams works great. It really does. And uh, the other guy that I like a lot would be Ralph Cutter's EC Caddis. That thing's money, and all over. So those are kind of the two guys that I would put together and fish a lot around here. Yeah, and, and even just with those two patterns, if you have a couple of sharpies, I mean, you could you could really open it up to. A large quantity of different things you're showing these fish so that's an awesome idea i've actually never heard of that um, but i might have to take that one next time i go out yeah just the, the flies that have distinct coloration definitely that you, you could get a little too dark on the greens with the gray body but the orange and the brown no problem they pick it up very nice awesome um so next, Brian, I'd like to, to talk, I guess, a little bit more about your trips specifically. Um, so what can a client necessarily expect when they book a trip with you? Let's kind of start with the morning, um, walk through when you guys first meet and going out to the rivers um, throughout a typical guided fishing day. Okay. Um, so typically we'll meet at, uh, I like to meet at Mountain Hardware. Um, they have fishing licenses, they have fishing gear, they have everything you need right here in town. And um, sometimes folks, like I had a guy the other day, 
thought he had his fishing license, but it turns out it was 2022, not 2023. So we can get that. I like to take care of that paperwork first and then go hit the water, um, talk about what they want to fish, what, what their expectations are for the day, and then give them some options. And there's usually a couple of options for whatever people want to do. And um, we'll pick one and, and on a half day, we'll go tackle that. And then on a full day, we'll try that, their first choice. And if it's not panning out in the afternoon, then we'll make some changes and go do some other stuff. And, and like I said, we have lots of options. So um, a lot of times the morning in the summer is going to be completely different than the afternoon due to the change in water temperature here. This doesn't stay cold the whole day. Right. And you mentioned um, one of the first things you do is, is kind of establishing expectations of the client. I think that's a huge part of guiding um, because obviously clients are going to differ whether they're you know, they booked a trip because it's their first time and they're super curious and want to learn everything. Or if it's somebody who's a little bit experienced, they may still want to learn, but more focused on, you know, maybe fishing a specific spot or targeting a specific um, trout or, you know, yeah. everyone has different expectations. So I think that's an ex extremely important part of it. And I'm sure you've seen that throughout guiding. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that just happened. You just... Like I said, I got multiple things going through my head when I meet you in the morning. And we can build a plan together based on what's happening. That's what we're going to try to do. That's awesome. Um, in your experience, what, what I guess would you describe your guiding style? Um, obviously, we just talked about it, expectations, but would you like to describe yourself as more of an educational teacher um, or more of somebody who's, like I mentioned, a targeting whether it's a specific area or specific hatch or something like that um i would say a combination of the two are pretty adaptable to both roles um some folks just want to go get after it and so it's just kind of okay i'm going to pick out a good section that we can work for part of the day and then they have to move again just because we're going so fast i would say i'm also pretty active um, I'm not one to go sit in one spot and fish that same spot all day. It doesn't work here. There's a couple of times in the spring where the inlets, yeah, that's where the fishing's at and moving isn't going to get us any, is it going to be any better? But um, the rest of the season, like I said earlier, Gabe wants to go seven miles. We're going to put in seven miles. And we're not in a boat. And so that's a way to cover a lot of water as well and show your stuff to a lot of different fish and your probability of catching fish and catching more fish goes up. It's pretty simple that way. 100%. And it's, it's extremely important, as you mentioned, to be adaptable because obviously clients are always changing, weather's always changing, river flows are always changing. You typically can't stick to one thing um, in this industry. You've got to be pretty flexible when it comes to that. So I think that's great advice. Yeah. And I've, I've had folks that are they're quite well off and they open the trunk and this is what I have. They'll have the Euro set up. They'll have the space set up. They'll have a really sweet bamboo rod set up. And it's like, ooh, I get to choose? <laughs> and I like those days too. And so we can combine some of that stuff around here as well. That's the kind of unique about it. I also think too that here, all of our venues, we can start fishing within about 20 minutes of town pretty easily, geared up and on the water. I don't have huge windshield time unless I go to uh, Milton or the North Eva, which is 50 minutes. So we're maximizing our time. Right. And if you're technique oriented and stuff like that, we got the truck here is awesome. We got flats, we got pocket water, we got riffles, we got got everything in between and uh, it, it makes makes it easy for me too if I have experienced folks or not experienced folks we can we've got something for everybody that's great to hear uh, that kind of brings me into my next topic one thing I've always thought was interesting of your services are the clinics that you provide um, and specifically kind of the the women's clinic I wanted to ask you about that and kind of what that looks like and how that runs 
Um, yeah, and thanks for mentioning those. Of, I had a list of things I was going to ask you, and that was one of them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I have some pretty specific clinics that I tried to set up for the time of year to be the time of year that you want to do that kind of stuff. It's a little bit early, so you can keep practicing after you leave. Um, so the women's clinic in particular, uh, that came about just – being part of the Orbis Endorse program, um, they were putting a big emphasis on women's clinic, and I had offered one the year prior, and it went over really well. And then um, with the help of uh, the guys and gals at Orbis, we, I did another one and got some different um, marketing channels going on that, and it was super successful. So is that typically you or do some Orvis um, partners come out and help you out with that? No, it's just me. Initially, it was part of their 50 on 50 thing. It was listed. It had a, a little additional marketing push to get going there. Um, but it's just me. I keep it to five people. That way I can help everybody. Um, I have gotten it a little bit bigger, but um, it's... This area isn't conducive to having large groups, in my opinion. It's the smaller, the better. So it's been four or five ladies every year, and then I've had some other folks call and we do a custom one as well. So they, they couldn't make the date, so I made one for them. And it worked out good. And awesome. And you have a couple other clinics. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Uh, I tried to do a nymphing clinic in the spring. Since that's typically when everybody's nymphing and I get a lot of calls about that. It's like, man, I'm not catching any fish. What can I do? Well, I'll take my nymphing clinic and I'll probably explain quite a bit in that and I get into the weight and stuff like that and the difference, like you said, of Euro versus Czech versus the the bobber um, and where to deploy both. And we go out and we do it. And uh, a lot of folks don't have any... Um, system so we say to their uh, they don't have a plan and they're not consistent with how they're putting their flies in the water and at this depth and how to control that they just have no idea so i kind of cover that with by sticking with one size of weight and adding and taking away as needed and i have a scale i weigh stuff so i'm trying to get it down to the grain in some instances and um I don't have to do that as much anymore, but it helps to show people that, hey, this is what I did. This guy right. told me to do this, and then I tried to take it to a different level from there. So that I have going on. And many moons ago, uh, I was doing trout spay clinics, and they went away for a while. I didn't fill them for a couple of years, and this year I started it back up again and had a really good response to that, um, especially since the lines that come so far in the last 10 years from when we started with our switch rods and stuff to what we have now really um, pretty user friendly so um, I kind of go through a lot of stuff there it's the setups same deal what you're trying to do what are you trying to catch and um, this try to match their stuff some some folks um, that the gear is not right it's not matched up they try to buy it themselves and uh you're better off going to the to the Orvis website and buying the setup complete with the right head and tips and everything rather than mixing and matching on your own because you got a good deal at Fast Pro Shop or something. Does not doesn't always go together. Uh, the other clinics that I've been doing would be your straight up intro clinic. Um, anybody can take that at any time. School, um, I do that. A lot. It seems like ten or fifteen times a year. That's that's what we're doing. Um, I'm having a brain fart here on a couple of things. Uh, so it sounds like to me um, the clinics are for people who are more specifically targeting either a new skill or a new technique or just in general a, a more learning a based aspect of the fishing rather than your guided trips is just kind of a general day out fishing. You can expect variety. You can expect a little bit of everything. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you for that. Of course. 
<laughs> well, it sounds amazing. Um, I've always, I've always loved the idea that you differentiate those because for a lot of, whether they're first timers or more advanced anglers, um, typically people just offer guided trips and that could be very vague. Um, so for someone looking, you know, for a more specific um, type of class, you do provide that option and that differentiation for those looking for that. So um, glad to hear they've been going well and glad to hear that you're keeping them around. Yeah, yeah I was super stoked to get the Chops Bay Clinic going again because that was one of the first ones I, I did and it was super fun and I filled it, like I said, three years in a row. I, I had a great time. It looked out awesome. Are they typically are they typically um, one party of people or is it could it be combined parties? You know, one person books, one person books here. Yeah, combined parties, and that's kind of where the go guide thing helped a lot this year. Is that where once you help me set up the clinic thing on the website, people can sign up as an individual, and that right. was that was super valuable. Then they call me and. I'll see if you have, I still have room. They can just look on the website and that's, that's huge. People are busy. And they can look on my website. They can look at the calendar. I have a seat left. They can sign up. That, that's huge. Thank you. Definitely. We're, we were happy to help you out with that. Um, I'm happy to keep it going. Um, so I kind of want to shift gears here. Um, okay. Obviously of a lot of, a lot of respect for how long you've been in this industry and I'm sure you've acquired a lot of knowledge and experience throughout the years. So I'd love to hear your advice to a younger guide or just a younger fisherman in general, who's possibly thinking about entering into the fly fishing industry as a guide. Um, I guess what are some of the tactics and tips that you would give this younger guide um, in order to get started as a fly fishing guide? and how to make sure they can build a good reputation and a good career in the fly fishing industry. Okay. Um, I guess first off, can you afford to do it? One of the things I noticed when I was trying to get going was all the people that seem to have the lodges or the um, outfitters and stuff like that, they'd already retired from some job. And um, I wasn't, I'm not. And, uh, so you kind of got to take that into consideration because you're not going to get super rich doing it. At least with my business model, I choose to be solo. Um, if you're an outfitter, then yeah, you're going to do pretty good probably, but you need to expect some lean times and, and prepare for that. And it's not all cracked up roses all the time. You're going to make some mistakes and just be ready for it and deal with it and fix it and keep going. Um, you could look into guide schools. Uh, when I started in our area, the Clearwater School was a big thing, and a lot of folks went to that. I know a lot of folks that have done quite well uh, from going to that guide school, and then um, go to some of the shows and, and meet with the people and see if there's an opening at a lodge somewhere where you can get started. It may not be fishing guide right away, but it might be something, you know, that gets you, get your foot in the door and go show people there that, hey, I know how to fish, I know how to do this. And then maybe also study that. You could um, uh, go and get your um, IFF certification for casting. That'll get you into a few, few doors there. Um, meet with uh, some of the other reps. And I think that's one of the things that helped me a lot was um, living in Chucky. Oh, at the time when I started, a lot of the reps were the major companies lived here. And um, I, I met them through skiing and other things and was able to reach out and go, hey, I want to try to do this and you can give me some advice on how to get started. And so I just went and asked the people that were doing it at the time. So nowadays I would say that that would still be a good thing to do because times are different. And um, the places that you want to go and stuff of uh, the cost of living is exponentially higher than when I started. So that's something to consider. Yeah, that's that's all great advice. Go if you could get a job working for a, a, 
a summer at another for another outfitter. That's awesome. Um, but be prepared. You, he's going to ask you if you own your boat. Do you have your own boat? Do you have fly rods? Do you have all that, that stuff? Like the initial cost is is great, but once you're going for a few years, it's, it works out. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely a repetitive part of this industry having to typically provide your own gear as a guide. And that's obviously as a solo operation. And if you're working for a fly shop or outfitter, I think that's one thing that surprised me when I, when I first, uh, my first year guiding was those questions of, all right, how many rods do you have? How many reels do you have? Do you have enough flies for an entire season? Um, so that is, that is something that if you, if you're looking to be a guide, just be ready to say yes to those questions and start building up possibly your quiver uh, now before it's too late. Yeah, and like I said earlier, I started saving up for stuff because I knew I wanted to do it. And so I kind of had a ballpark number that I wanted to get in the bank so that I could not work and not sweat it. Just started building up a savings so that I could go out and make the, the move that I needed to. So like I said, don't quit your day job. That's right. For a couple of seasons, <laughs> and, and you know, maybe the first place you go isn't isn't a good fit for you, and um, you want to try somewhere else. And uh, and I worked at a, a lodge, and it was great the first couple of years, but then when they changed ownership, it wasn't so great. So you, you gotta like what you're doing, and if it's not tripping your trigger, then you're not probably gonna the best you can for your folks you want to be feeling good about where you're at and promoting that that place too because it's taking care of you but if they're not then, you know, that's hard gotta, definitely gotta have that experience definitely um and you had mentioned obviously brian you're a solo guide um what are some of the differences in you know being a one-man operation essentially versus if somebody were to go work for a fly shop or outfitter, what are some of the advantages and even some of the disadvantages um, to solo operation versus, you know, a, a big fly shop or outfitter with 15, 20 guides? Um, for the, 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 the guide as an individual or for the customer? I guess for the guide, I guess we could do both sides. Um, okay. I actually like the idea of, of from a customer point of view too, because I haven't I hadn't thought of that. Okay, well, for me being solo, you're going to get me. You're booking me. You're going to go with me. I'm doing the communications. I'm taking care of the launch, the shuttle, um, all of it. I I provided all the gear and my stuff, so um, I'm a one man show, and I have everything. I'm the magician. I'm with the hat. And I'm just pulling stuff out of the back all day long um, and then as uh, for the, the customer going with a, a outfitter and when did you book did you are you where are you on the list of things are you with the, the top tier guys that he has or are you with the new guy you know, if you book two days prior you're not going to get the best guy probably so kind of keep that in mind when you're planning your vacation uh, it'd be really nice if folks all the time booked a lot sooner. That would that makes your, everybody's life a lot easier, and uh, they they should expect to ask some more questions when you're dealing with the um, outfitter type stuff. You have some questions and you make sure they answer them. If they can't answer it, then maybe that's not the outfit you should go with as a, as a customer. But there should be some follow up. All that. Stuff. I try to do that all right away and get get that done. So I think that is a big aspect is is when they're booking with you, you know exactly what you're gonna get. You're gonna get an experienced fly fishing guide who's fished these waters for over twenty years. And that's that. You know, when you versus one of these shops, like you said, it could be either a rookie guide or their senior guide. And typically you wouldn't necessarily have the option. Um, so that is a big aspect that I hadn't quite thought of, but that's definitely something to think about when booking. Yeah. Be really clear with what you want to get out of your day ahead of time. You know, it's, 
awesome when folks say, hey, I'm a beginner, I've never fished out of a boat before, so this is a new experience and I would need some time to take, go with somebody that's good at that, that, at getting folks started in fishing out of a good boat or started fishing on a walking road trip. I, I, need, I don't know where to start. At least I got the conversation going and make sure that that's transferred to the to the guy that you get and then reiterate it with him. Because that's having that communication is key. And then ask questions. It's amazing how many folks have a lot of questions at the beginning, but once we get going, we don't get anything out of them as we're going through the day. Keep asking questions. Keep pushing. It's okay. I don't, I'm not going to take offense to any of that. It's like, hey, I want to try this. Okay. Here's why it will work and here's why it possibly won't work. Let's give it a shot. Free rig and go. And uh, it's okay. All that's, it's just all part of it. And it comes down to a guide trying to be his own guide versus um, working for somebody else. Um, that, again, you need to find a place that, that you're comfortable with, people that you're comfortable with, because there are some that, I, I wouldn't work for him. And uh, I'm sure you would either. You want to have a good time. Like, I just, like I said, I had a super good experience starting out. And the people I worked with were awesome. They're still my friends today. Um, we still try to go fishing once, twice a year if we can and drink beer and tell lies and do all the kind of stuff that we want to. But as your own guy, you got to take into consideration your insurance, your retirement, and all that kind of stuff. What do you how are you going to build that? You need to work a lot. Um, as you're working for somebody else, is any of that stuff included? Um, are they paying you cash so they don't have to do anything if something happens to you and you get hurt? There's, something could happen. You could drop an anchor on your foot. Um, any of that kind of stuff. They got to carry on with these comp and stuff. I think those things are important. Not so much how much you're going to make, but in case something goes wrong, it's what's going on because you're tired you're putting in a lot of days that's how you make your money you've got to work a lot and um, if you make any mistakes it, it could shut you down for a while and uh, you know one, one have a good fit two are they on the up and up and I'm having a good time with them you know they, they help me they, they start the guide group they're all helping each other I really like that a lot our, our spot, um, we had a lot of banter back and forth every day. We had, just like if we were ski patrolling and we were kind of debriefing the day, um, we would say what worked today, what didn't work today, and how did we miss the forecast or did we hit it right on? Got open on time, we didn't, you know, that sort of stuff. It was kind of, there's a lot of similarities to what we're doing when we're working in a group. And uh, I, I like the me the camaraderie thing and the being able to problem solve together and stuff like that yeah that's that's a big part of it that i think a lot of probably young guys don't quite understand because they might see whether they're a solo guide or working for a different outfit than some other guides um it's still extremely important to have good etiquette and make good reputations with the other guides in the area because in the end that's going to be who you know might give you a little bit of advice or you can kind of trade, you know, what's fishing good, what's not fishing good, what patterns are fishing well. Um, and it's a lot of a lot more teamwork, I think, than people typically expect coming in and think maybe thinking, you know, oh, this guy's my competition because he doesn't work for the same outfit for me. Um, however, those are some of the most re important relationships you can have as a, as a young guy. Yeah, and um, I don't think people realize the depth that some of the guide services get into and um, when they're a big group going out it's like okay you got this line you got this line you got this line don't mix them up that way everybody's catching fish everybody's fishing for different fish not following the lead boat at all the way down so the fourth boat in the lineup the those fish are like <laughs> I'm out of here it's an yeah. time. but if I mean like I said, I, I worked for a couple of different guide services and the ones that talk like that and 
got into the nitty gritty of what's working, what's not, where we need to be, who needs to leave early, because it's, you know, no two days are the same. Those were the ones that everybody had the best experience, both for the guides and as the customers. They're working it. That's right. Well, that's great advice. Um, and before we before we wrap up, Brian, I know that you run some destination trips in Montana. Uh, yep. Would you like to talk at all about those? Yeah, um, I have a, a really fun trip that uh, I do with uh, Jim Mitchell at Montana Hunting and Fishing in Hamilton, Montana. And uh, he also has a shop in uh, Darby. Um, but we, uh, we fished the Blackfoot for a day and the Bitter for three days. Um, that's really, uh, really been fun. Um, we stay in Missoula the coming and going and then stay in some cabins in uh, Hamilton for the three days that we're on the bitter route. And uh, it's worked out really good. Um, it's not super expensive. It's not lavish, but um, we have a good time and uh, it's, it's been super. Um, I haven't sold it out yet. I can take a lot of people if I want to, but We've been hitting the six and eight, uh, you know, four to four boat trips, which is really perfect for that that area. And uh, the accommodations are awesome. The cabins we stay at are really cool, and we'll uh, we'll eat out, and come in and go in from there, and do our own dinners and breakfasts in, in Hamilton. So those your those cabins are those cabins on the river that typically clients are staying on. Uh, you can't, you can hear the river. You can't really see it because all the cottonwoods and willows, but there's a trail down to it. Um, and then they have their own pond with bass in it. So if you get enough fishing in, you can go right in front of the cabin and, uh, fish for bass, or you can walk down to the river. Um, it's only a couple hundred yards, but getting through the brushes. Gotcha. And what, what time of year is that? It was, uh, last week. It's usually the first week in August. Okay. So you guys, you guys had just done it. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's great to hear. Do you guys plan to do it this up, this upcoming August? Yes. Yep. And, uh, I've had like four guys that have been going for five or six years now. And, uh, I get a few of my other clients throughout the season that they sign up and go. And, uh, like I said, it's really, I like it because they tell me they like it, so I, I know I did the right thing. It's only four days, um, but it's super good fishing, and our outfitter is, uh, he's awesome. I can't say enough about Jim. He does a great job. Well, that's great to hear. I'm sure you enjoy a little change of scenery every once in a while, too, and getting to fish some new water as well. Oh, yeah. Who doesn't want to go to Montana? Come on. That's right. That's right. It's, it's pretty nice. All right, Brian. Well, is there any uh, anything else that you, any questions you have for me or anything else you'd like to talk about before we wrap up? Um, I guess one of the, where I was brain farting was I wanted to mention the Tenkara stuff. And okay. I do that. Um, I don't necessarily have any clinics on that. I am doing presentations on it this year. I have two um, presentations I'll be doing for some local clubs, but um yeah, people uh, have found me through the Tenkara website that I'm on and, and just calling and asking. They saw that I do Tenkara. So, um, and what is what is Tenkara? Can you explain that a little bit further? Tenkara is a Japanese style of uh, fly fishing with uh, one fly, no reel, and a fixed length of line. Um, supposed to make things simpler, I would argue. Uh, especially if you're fishing pressured water, um, may not may not be the right tool for the job, but um, change things up and it works just fine. Uh, I like it for a couple of reasons. It is super compact, so if you want to go backpacking, it's about the lightest uh, setup you could could take with you, and you can make adjustments to fish lakes. I had some folks that oh, you can't fish lakes with them. Yes, you can. You just lengthen the length of the line. You can get it where it needs to go. Um, and uh, it works, you know, really, really good. And more open creeks and stuff like that, super, super good 
idea. I like it. I use it. I take it on my mountain bike. I take it on my motorcycle. I'm cruising around. There's a couple of places where I want to go check out for before a trip. I'll take the tin car a lot and jump on my motorcycle and go out there. Super fast, super light. Um, yeah, I've always liked how they, they collapse it within themselves, right? Pretty much. So they get to about maybe a foot or so. And that's, you, like you said, you could bring that anywhere. Yeah, some that are even smaller. And uh, I've had some clients show up with wanting to take their kids that were pretty darn young, like five years old. And like, I got a car ride for them. I'm like, hmm. All right. <laughs> I'm willing to, I'm game. I'll try. I'll bite. <laughs> and uh, the little six footer was amazing, where maybe an eight foot rod for the five year old really the right, right plan. And uh, we had a great time. Worked super. And uh, I think it's a good way to get, get the kids started and stuff, too, because that you got to be pretty careful with it. You know, you don't want to, they got to learn that they can't break this thing right away. It's super light and it feels fragile and it's not, but it kind of right. has a profession that it is. And you can catch some pretty darn big fish on it, too. Like, that's what blows me away. The, the amount of flex and everything that goes into that thing and say, wow, that big old fish bent that thing all the way to the handle and still had <laughs> 5X tippet. Well, yeah. There are some drawbacks well, that's... in our area to it. I would say that the wind is, a, is the thing is so soft that the deflection from the wind is problematic and I have to I do different things to deal with the wind. I overweight it and stuff like that, but Right. That's, that's just part of it. It's everybody should try it at least once. Um, so, a, can we expect a, a Tenkara clinic coming soon from Four Seasons Fly Fishing? I guess I could. Yeah. <laughs> I should throw it if not, I guess anyone I'm sure can can either request in the notes when booking you, or even over the phone is kind of the best way to do it at the moment. Yeah, and I really appreciate when people fill out the notes section. Before I call them, then I, I got to, we can get right into booking their trip and getting their expectations in the right spot and all that. That's right. You heard it here first. Utilize the, uh, the customer notes section when booking through GoGuide. It really helps our guides out. Yeah. It just, boom, we can get, get, get you signed up, make the plan. You know what's coming. I know what's coming. And uh, that works really good. Makes our, our phone That's right. go faster too. So, um, yeah, I think that probably was the thing that I was missing when I wanted to say it earlier. I was mentioning with Tenkara. Well, great to hear. That's not not too many of our guides um, offer that. So you're definitely one of the more niche guides. So anyone out there looking for Tenkara, four seasons fly fishing. Um, Go fish the trucky here with Brian. Brian, thank you again for, for doing this. I'm going to go ahead and close it out. Um, but thanks again for coming on, and we've loved having you. Thank you, Seth, and thank you for signing me up.